the text this morning. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man, praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is the one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as a woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God." Judge among yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would open our hearts to receive what you would say to us through your spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Ever since I started the series in 1 Corinthians, uh, there's been just a little bit of anticipation about what would happen once we got to that chapter, as it is affectionately known. This is, these verses, 15 verses we read, one of the most contested, interesting, and unique passages in all Scripture. And I personally, in, I don't know, 15, 17 years of preparing sermons, have never come across a series of verses outside the book of Revelation with as many contradictory perspectives from various commentators, not just on the whole thing, but on individual verses. So if you have an opinion from one end to the other, you can find five guys who agree with you and about 400 who don't. So just know that there's always people who already, have th- who already think what you may think. Now this is not to complain about God's Word, but to say that anyone who believes he has the final word on this passage is probably lacking in humility. Some of the greatest commentators in our tradition admit their ignorance on certain portions. One of my favorite quotes is from the Geneva Bible of 1599, who when it comes to verse 10, which says that a... Uh, said a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. The Geneva Bible says in its notes, What this meaneth I do not yet understand. <laughs> when I read that, I thought, somebody else. Sir, somebody else just like me. And that's not the only place where you can find people who say, I'm really not sure. But... Just because there's mystery doesn't mean we say, well, because we don't know, we can just ignore it. It's God's Word. So we dig into it. We strive to learn. But I want to say also in introduction, in a passage like this, we must beware because everybody's focused on what? Should you wear a head covering or should women wear a head covering or not? That's what, that's what everyone gravitates towards. And the Apostle Paul, actually, he, will, he, he is saying in verse 2, when he says, I praise you that, you've, that you keep the things I've commanded, he, he, he's already talked about this previously to the church at Corinth. 
This is not the first time. So this is further explanation about the principle. But we can easily ignore the things that he is saying here. The greater point that he makes, which is that you have simultaneous hierarchy and also mutual dependence between men and women, both of whom are submitted to God, so, so we can distract ourselves from what he is saying with, all, with, with, with the one thing that we want to know. So be aware of that. And then one more thing. I'm, I'm going to actually start in verse 16 because that's an important verse for us to consider when Paul says, if anyone is contentious, we have no such custom. So this text, or the, what he's teaching here, was a matter of disagreement even then, at least among some. Now, because he begins in verse 2, praising them that they're keeping it, 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 it demonstrates that there's probably not the majority, but there are still some in the church who are not uh, willing on this. And, and he says that it's not, for him, if, you're, if someone's contentious, we're not going to press this. It does not rise to the level of importance that the following passage of Scripture, found in verses 17 through 34, that that's communion. It, this topic is not as important, he's saying, as communion. Because when it comes to people eating and drinking unworthily in the communion meal, he said there's people who die because of that. So there's nothing about people dying in these first 15, in, in these 15 verses. So, you know, whatever your perspective is, it's not worth giving your life over. Okay? Because Paul understands, and part of the whole point of this book in Corinthians is don't destroy the church over issues that are not important. And you find this throughout the book. And one of the principles also that he, he speaks of in verse chapters 8 through 14 is it's all about gifts. It's all about people practicing their gifts. And when they're practicing their gifts, every gift that God gives, not, not just the specific what we know is a spiritual gift, but we said in chapters 8 and 9 there, there's, there's the gift of Christian liberty. In chapter 10 there's the gift of the sacraments. And Paul is saying that all the gifts that God gives, they can be used in the wrong way and in the wrong fashion. And if you use the gifts in the wrong way, chaos is the result. So all these chapters, 8 through 14, that are all about using gifts properly in a way that edifies, that builds up the church. So I want to give three principles that we will consider in these verses and the first principle that the Apostle Paul explains is that of headship. And the first principle is headship in verses 2 and 3. So again, Paul commends the church for following the teaching he gave at a previous time about, uh, with regards to head coverings. And, but, but here again, he explains the reason behind it, and, and it... You can see when he says, starts in verse 2, Now I praise you, this is contrasted with verse 17. Verse 17 is when he talk, starts talking about communion. In verse 17 he says, Now in giving these instructions, said, in other words, now that we're talking about a different topic, that is communion, I praise you not. So, verse 2, I praise you. In other words, high five, good job. You guys are for the most part keeping as you're supposed to. And then verse 17 I need to deal with something here. I can't praise you about how you're practicing communion. But then in verse 3, we run into to, to the first discussing, discussion topic. He uses the word head. The head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now that word head here means source or coming from. It doesn't mean the one who is domineering, the one who is greater in being than another. 
Because what happens if you say that the head of, when he says that the head of Christ is God, if you start saying that the Father is superior in essence to the Son, you're in the middle of a really ugly heresy there. So you've got to be careful how we look at how we view these words. So it means source. So, so here's another way that we can say what Paul is saying in verse 2. Adam, or man, was formed by Christ, by the Word. Okay? He was formed from the dust of the ground by the Word. Then Eve, or woman, came from man, right? She was taken out of the man. And then Jesus, in His incarnation, not in His eternal being as God, but Jesus in His incarnation, He, he came through the... He was conceived as a man by the power of the Spirit. You follow me? So, 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 so we have this, this pattern, and this pattern is what Paul is relying on to build the rest of what he's saying here. So, so we have headship. And the principle of headship means that we must recognize and be about the purposes of our head. We must recognize and be about the purposes of our head. I mean, I will go ahead and tell you, this passage is clearly, undoubtedly, one thing we can, we can say for sure, it is teaching submission. One of my favorite quotes that I came across was by a man who's he's a pretty good, he's a German, pretty good theologian, but he's quite liberal, and so he doesn't believe he actually would have to follow what the Scripture says, but, but, but he's pretty good at saying what the Scripture says. And, and he said... Something like, this is, this passage is requiring submission. Our, our submission to God and a wife's submission to her husband. I don't like it and I don't agree with what Paul says and I think he's wrong, but that is what the passage says. I'll take the honesty where I can get it. I'm fine with that. I'm not fine with it. You know what I mean. Jesus, we read in Scripture came to do the will of whom? The Father. That's Scripture. Jesus came to do the will of His Father. Men are called to do the work of Christ, to fulfill the work that Jesus... I mean, Jesus came and did His work, and we are called to imitate Him. And then a wife is called to aid her husband in his calling. Now, yes, she's called to honor Christ as well. But... It is not God's intention that husbands and wives work at contrary purposes while both are claiming to serve the kingdom. Have you ever seen this before? It happens. We, when, when, when people, and again, it's not only in a marriage, that's why the, the actual Greek words, in, in some translations it says husbands and wives, others men and women, but we have to be careful not to just single out only in the home here because that's not what that's, Paul does not say that. So anyway, the first principle is headship. But the second principle we see is that of honoring our head. The second principle is honoring our head, verses 4 through 6. The one who does not use his or her gifts within the ordained limitations that God places, dishonors the one you are called to serve. So, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So, if, you, if a man goes about using this particular gift in a way that draw, he is drawing attention with, with his covering... He's drawing more attention, Paul is saying, to himself when his call is to direct attention to God. I've told pastors before, especially young pastors, that if you stand up in front of the congregation and people notice you more than they grow in the knowledge of the God whom you serve, you're doing it wrong. And 
part of Paul's point is we've got to be careful that we don't become glory hogs. So then he says, the woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Now, he's not talking about this head. Talking about, again, her source, the one that she is called to serve, her husband or her father. At this point, things can start to unravel if we forget to situate the passage, again, within the larger context about what Paul is saying. Again, he's talking about people using their gifts. Now, there were certain people who were using their gifts. People had gifts back then that we do not see in the same way today. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about that when we get to chapter 14. But uh, it is important here to answer a couple of questions regarding the context of 1 Corinthians 11. So first of all, what is the prayer and prophecy Paul's talking about? He talks about both men and women praying and prophesying. Well, after, again, reading, studying, looking at this, I am convinced that the prayer and prophecy referred to here is prayer and prophecy of a supernatural sort. That it is not merely people who are praying quietly to themselves. When Paul speaks of public prayer, in first, the, the, the only other time he speaks of public prayer in this way in 1 Corinthians 14, it is in reference to praying in tongues. Now, we, we could talk about that for a while, and, and th- there, there's plenty of things to discuss, but then the term prophecy is even more explicit. The term prophecy means speaking something supernatural. And it is throughout the New Testament, over and over, it is seen as exercising a supernatural Gift. It's not just someone speaking publicly as I'm doing right now. So we can see in verse in a place like Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Not doing very well in my sword drill right now. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. This is actually Peter is quoting from the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Okay? Now he's not saying that you're going to have a lot of preachers who show up. Okay? That prophecy from Joel is specifically referring to what would happen to the church when the Spirit came. Pentecost. And Peter's claiming that. He's saying you're, you've, you see this fulfilled before you. And then also we know 1 Corinthians 13, Paul, the, the great love chapter, which we will come to later on. He will, he will say that there, there are certain gifts that will pass away. So where there's prophecies, they're going to end. Where there's tongues, they will cease. Where there's knowledge, it will vanish away. And now I'll buy these three faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So again, and then in chapter 14, there's a lot about speaking prophetically there, which is in the way of something that is supernatural. So that's the prayer and prophecy, I believe, is a reference to the supernatural gifts. But then the second thing, and, and this is something, again, where people may have questions, but... The second question we must answer is, where are these gifts practiced by men and women? And I believe the prayer and prophecy spoken of here is not in Lord's Day worship. Now, I realize a lot of times your Bibles will say, they'll they'll have this this topic at the top of of chapter 11 that will say, instructions for worship, for public worship. Well, I can promise you that part was not written by the Apostle Paul when he gave the letter. He did not say, now I'm going to talk about public worship. 
Now, there's two reasons why I say it's not a reference to public worship. First of all, in these verses, Paul does not use the normal language for gathering together as the church the way that he does when he talks about communion, starting in chapter 11, verse 17. And in fact, he will use that phrase, he'll, he'll say the phrase in chapter, uh, chapter 11, 17 through 34, when you come together, or coming together, or gather as the church, something like that. He will say that over and over, and then he uses that same phrase again in chapter 14 when he's giving instructions to the church regarding order in their public worship. So Paul does not use that language here. But secondly, and I would say more importantly, I do not believe this is corporate Lord's Day worship because men and women are both speaking. And we know in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35, Paul clearly, he's talking about Lord's Day worship there. He says, quote, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church, end quote. Well, then he says also in 1, Corinthians, excuse me, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, He's, giving, he's talking about worship. I would that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. He goes on, he says, Let a woman learn in silence and in all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Paul did not write one thing in chapter 11 about women praying and prophesying, and then change his mind in chapter 14 and say, now they can't. So, so what then could this be if it's not on, on Lord's Day worship? Well, remember Acts chapter 2, that the Christians gathered throughout the week in one another's homes. And when they were gathering each week, or excuse me, gathering throughout the week in one another's homes, not just on Sundays, there, there, these were times where Surely supernatural gifts were practiced by men and women to the edification of the saints. We even have a record of one of these in Acts chapter 21 verse 9. We read of Philip, the evangelist, his four daughters prophesied. So the call from the Apostle Paul here is, again, keeping the main thing in mind. We are called to honor our Head in using gifts, in using the gifts that we have. Now, kind of as a subcategory of honoring our head, he gives reasons for this in verses 7 through 12. So this is not a principle, but these are just reasons for, uh, the, the reason for honoring our head. And Paul says that the reason for honoring our head is that when we do so, when we honor the one who is, in a, in a sense, our source, we reflect glory. Verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of the man. For a man is not from, excuse me, for a man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created from woman, but woman for, excuse me, nor was man created for the woman, but woman for for the man. We honor our source, the one we are called to serve, not by promoting our own glory, but by reflecting glory towards the one we are called to honor. This is not an easy thing. Because, now, okay, I'll tell you this. Sometimes for men... We are called specifically, Paul says, that, that the head of man is Christ. Christ is perfect. But sometimes the one that our wives are called to honor, or your wife is called to honor, is the husband. And often husbands are not, they don't always act worthy of honor. This is where division comes in. 
But we were never meant to bring glory to ourselves, but to reflect that glory to another. Husbands, as you exercise your gifts, you are called to reflect glory to Christ and to build those up for whom you are responsible. It's never only pointing one way, it's also pointing the other as well. You're called to build up while you bring glory. You don't just hold glory yourself. As you lead well, you bring glory, you receive glory from your wife and honor Christ. The more... The more a man grows in leading well, the more his wife is honored. And it reflects. She becomes more radiant, more glorious as she is led in glory. This is a tall order, brothers. Wives, God made you to come alongside and support your husband in his role of honoring Christ. There is a temptation, and there was a temptation at this time at the, w- w- within the church when they would gather that Paul, Paul is addressing for women who practice their public Gifts. A woman who would pray or prophesy, guess what? There is a temptation for her to be admired not only for her gifts that she was exercising, but for the beauty and glory that she displayed. Particularly, long hair. Now, You can read for a while about how hair was viewed a little bit differently in ancient times. It was seen as something that would, we'll just say, for for many, the longer a woman's hair was in the ancient world, the better wife she was considered to be. Okay, She, she, She was seen as being able to probably have more children. And there's a lot of other factors that go into this which I will not get into now. But this glory that she has, it could be a distraction. And to protect both the women and the rest of the people, Paul says they should temporarily cover their glory as they speak God's words. So when a woman was speaking praying or prophesying before others, she would cover her head in Corinth. And in the background of all this, we have the creation story. Paul alluded to it earlier when he talks about woman was formed from man and and so on. Eve fell when she was deceived by Satan without the protection of her husband. And it was both. Adam did not provide the protection. He did not provide the covering that she needed. And also, she was engaging in speaking to the serpent rather than letting her husband do that. Men and women, boys and girls, you are not made... To honor yourself. But bring honor to God and to those God has placed over you. Proverbs says, even a child is known by his doings, whether his work is good and whether it is right. So when, kids, when you act, whatever way you act, when you act a certain way, you are always reflecting on your parents. When you honor your parents, when you do what your parents tell you to do, you are showing, you you are giving a type of glory to them. You can say, this is not fair. That's the way God made the world. It's not fair that we get salvation through Christ. That's also the way God ordained 
the world. Same way, wives, you demonstrate a kind, you, you project glory towards your husband. I mean, it just happens. You can't say, I refuse to do it. Well, you, you can, but that's going to show up too. So either way, it, it's going to happen. But when we forget our calling, when we forget the calling to not, get, not hold glory to ourselves, we leave the authority God placed over us and we become vulnerable to the enemy just like Eve was vulnerable. And she dealt with an angel. That, that, that famous passage Women should have a symbol of authority on their head because of the angels. And we, you know, often we, we just think of the good guys. You know, Gabriel and Michael and, and, and all those other angels. And yes, they are, but, but there are also other angels at work and they're not all good guys. And the fact that the creation story is in the background throughout this text, I do not think that we can ignore the other angels who are present as well. Just as Eve was tempted when she left the covering of her husband. That, that temptation exists for all of us. Refusing to demonstrate your submission to authority makes you more vulnerable to enemy attack. Now here guys can think, this is pretty good. I'm the authority of my wife, and Jesus is my authority, and he's not going to say... Well, he does, but you get the point, right? It doesn't work that way. God has placed other authorities over us as well, brothers. And in, the, in the, all that you do, whether in your job, whether in the church, whether in the public sphere, you demonstrate your submission to authority in your actions. So don't make yourself vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. Well then, after seeing a little bit more of the reason for honoring our head, we come to a, a third principle here, and that is that wisdom is necessary in this matter. Wisdom is necessary. Paul says in verses, and this is verses 13 through 16, judge among yourselves. So he takes an interesting turn. He doesn't often tell the people, you need to think about this. You need to make a judgment on this. It's not purely rhetorical. He's not saying, yeah, all the smart people are going to be on board. No, he's saying, you are called to judge well here. Is it normal for a man to wear long hair? Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? And I would be remiss here. Pray for me, I'm going off script. But if I left out the modesty element as well, because that is also within this passage. John Calvin famously argued in his, uh, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians 11, he said that the covering, and yes, Calvin believed that, that women should cover in public worship. His reasoning was he said that it is largely because it once you leave off head covering, more immodesty will follow and eventually they will expose, and he just fills in blanks that I won't fill in here. But for him it's, it's modesty. And Paul, in 1 Timothy 2, will also refer to the importance of modesty. So I, will, I just want to keep that principle in mind when you are reading this. That maintaining modesty is part of our calling as, as well. Now, is it normal, again... Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor? 
Don't you even understand this just by looking around in the world? Or then what about if a woman is shorn? Now, we're not just talking about short hairstyles. We're talking about something that is a very close cropped haircut. One that is purposely intended to be less feminine. Is that normal? And Paul says to both the answers, no. Normally, women would demonstrate their femininity with their hair, which he says is their glory. But they would cover it, and at that time in the church at Corinth, when a, when a woman was praying or prophesying, when they were meeting during the week. Now there is an allowance, though, we remember in the Old Testament, for men with long hair. What was that? Nazarites. So is Paul contradicting the Nazarite vow? Now I can tell you the answer is no, because if you read Acts, Paul took a Nazarite vow once. Did he believe he had to? No, but it was available. It was possible. It was something where a man would allow his hair to grow out. He would not touch certain things. He would not drink certain things because he was giving himself to becoming a temporary holy warrior. He was going in a different form for a short time for a particular purpose in God's kingdom. Now, a woman who publicly speaks in praying or prophesying is doing the opposite of a Nazarite. She is covering her glory. She is covering her hair. Because she is temporarily taking on a role that was largely given to men. Because while we do read of women at times praying and prophesying in Acts, the large majority of this is men. That's natural, but Paul, again, he, God is not stingy with his gifts. But a woman must at those times, Paul is saying, wear a man-made covering instead of the glorious natural covering God gave her. Verse 15, if a woman has long hair, it is a glory for her, to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. So hair is a natural, beautiful covering. But when you temporarily go into this space, speaking God's word, you must cover it with a natural, man-made covering. Now, with that brief introduction, allow me to go into some detailed application. Don't worry. But what can we take from this text. What are the applications to be made? Well, first of all, whether you are a man or a woman, you are called to exercise, excuse me, you are called in your life to exercise your gifts. Practice your gifts. But never use your gifts to create division or separation in your marriage or in other relationships. Don't take advantage of your gifts as a way to put distance between yourself and your authority. Practicing your gifts should be in harmony with your spouse, with your parents, etc., not contrary to them. Second application. No one is independent. I did not spend much time on this. Believe it or not, there's a few things we could have spent a little bit more time on. But we were made, Paul says, from one another and for one another. Though Paul does talk about how the source of man is Christ, and then the source of the woman is the man. Later on, he will say, he's kind of explaining that we should not be be too high-minded with this. Verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is a man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man comes through woman. So in, in other words, guys, don't be a pig about this and think that you can just look down on her because, well, woman came from man. Paul said, yeah, and you also came from a mom. So we are not independent. Men, you cannot fulfill your, your entire work 
without women in some way or form. At the very least, it took a woman to get you into this world. And all of us in this room rely, whether you're married or single, you rely on women and women who exercise their spiritual gifts. But also, women, God made you to need the help of men as they help in your calling. You cannot do everything on your own. We are, we are stronger when our gifts are working together. Number three, the third application, and this is especially to men, do not ignore the wisdom of women. It was, it was expected in this time that Christian women in the ancient world would have wise things to say. And that is something we should continue to expect. Wisdom in Proverbs is personified as a woman who speaks. Remember Deborah, Miriam, and Philip's daughters. Don't forget also Priscilla, Aquila's wife. She and her husband both taught the learned Apollos when he came to Ephesus. Both of them were teaching. Your wife, brothers, your wife is filled with God's Spirit as well. So do not just stay quiet and pretend to listen while she's talking. Receive what she has to say as potential wisdom. And do not despise it just because you think you may know something more than her in an area. And lastly, the last application. It is not the belief of the pastors or elders in our church that head coverings are required from Scripture in corporate worship. From our perspective, they are a choice of attire, not a necessity. In other words, it's fine, but it's not demanded. People, this is a, a matter of conscience. We have plenty of other matters of conscience here. And if the church cannot walk together and abstain from being contentious in matters of conscience, we're not walking in the kingdom the right way. So whether you agree or disagree with your neighbor on this issue, going back to verse 16, your calling is to not be contentious or try to sway other people towards your view. In conclusion... God has given all of us particular gifts. The kingdom grows when we use our gifts within the authority God established. So use your gifts in harmony with your head. The one God has called you to follow. Exercise your gifts in submission to your authority and let others... Use their gifts. Those who are around you, give them the freedom to use their gifts to serve God's kingdom as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for teaching us and guiding us in wisdom. And I pray that we would indeed receive and grow. Through Christ we pray. Amen.